our, our first speaker in the afternoon session is Katrina Sedgwick, who's going to talk a little bit about how we can remove the access uh, barriers, especially in um, preservation access and, and reuse scenarios uh, in, in, in reference to a big project that Katrina is working on at the moment. As many of you will know, uh, Katrina is the director and CEO of the Australian Centre for the Moving Image in Melbourne. Um, and previously she's worked in television and film festivals. She founded the South Australian Film Festival, uh, commissioning um, amazing work for uh, that organisation um, and is currently the Deputy Chair of the Creative Industries Advisory Group in Victoria. Uh, we don't have one of those in New South Wales, which is um, something to note. We do <laughs> need one. Uh, but at the moment, she's working on what I would call a truly epic project. It's a $40 million epic project. Uh, please welcome Katrina to talk to us this afternoon. I too would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, so uh, the moving image um, is so ubiquitous in our lives these days. And with it, we're witnessing an incredible democratisation of its creation, distribution and its consumption, which is at once both wonderful and utterly terrifying. We can choose now what we watch and when we want to watch it, wherever we want to see it. Our data is simultaneously being harnessed to enable and to exploit and monetize our choices. And our content is being served up to us through algorithms and AI. But anyone who can afford a computer or a smartphone now has the possibility of not being just a consumer, but taking a far more active role in making and distributing media, becoming a broadcaster. This incredible power is equally available to children and to their parents and to their grandparents. And it makes media producers of student climate activists, of right-wing nationalists, of garage bands and wedding guests alike. The digitisation of collections has been a priority for many collecting institutions for two decades now, possibly three actually, I'm showing my age, time's going fast. Uh, the opportunity to make objects, artworks and artefacts in museums, archives, libraries and galleries available online for audiences to access anywhere at any time shifts the kind of traditional old fashioned inward looking culture of collecting institutions and archives and enables the public to share the wonder and knowledge that resides in these often publicly and sometimes privately owned collections. And it has the potential to not only allow the public to browse and discover these artworks and media and objects and stories remotely, but it can also enable a much more active relationship to the content through shareability and through reuse. And for ACME, the opportunities for the creative use of digital tools to enable access to audiovisual archives, even with its complex copyright and commercial requirements, is really exciting. I first became fascinated with the creative potential of digitised archives in 2005 when I was directing the Adelaide Film Festival. As part of our first rather quaintly named Digi Day uh, in 2005, um, this was a summit that was designed to look at the opportunities that rapidly emerging digital technology could bring to the screen sector and to its audiences. We showcased a bold initiative by the BBC called the Creative Archive. And forgive me if you've heard me talk about this before because I've been talking about it nonstop since 2005. It was led by Tony Aggie, um, who was head of the archive at the BBC at that time. He's now the head of digital at the New York Public Library. And um, perhaps he was inspired, in fact, by the example that John talked about before, the record store, and the ability for practitioners to go in and, and find material and sample it uh, to create their own content. Um, he created the Creative Archive, which mined the BBC's vast audiovisual archive and enabled uh, or 
set up, put online um, over 500 items of digitised content. There were clips of uh, pieces of television and news um, from across over 50 years of broadcasting. And they were available to the public to explore, share, but vitally to reuse. These items were not from their commercial businesses and they used what was then a, a very fresh uh, and recently designed Creative Commons licence to enable what was a radical new approach to their archive. It became a wonderful resource for researchers, industry and for the general public. The Creative Archive Licence Group quickly expanded to include libraries, universities and museum partners over the U uh, all over the UK. Um, unfortunately, it only lasted three years in its original firm form and by 2008, funding cuts unfortunately took their toll. But it really was absolutely groundbreaking in the opening up of the BBC archive to the British people who owned it. So say you were a train spotter and you're passionate about trains. You could go into that archive and you could mine it for trains, train clips and you could create your own kind of party tape of train clips and you could share them with your train spotting friends. Um, I think that's just fantastic. So then maybe if we flip it now to today um, and you could access the BBC's Creative Archive, you've just submitted your band's new song to Triple J Unearthed and you've got to get a film clip together. You can go into that archive and you can use footage from the 1950s and reuse it and create a wonderful uh, music video to go with your, to go with your work. As Lord David Putnam said at the time, the Creative Archive Licence Group exists to ensure public access to public archives is optimised in the digital, digital age. It's quite simple. We all pay for the upkeep of the material in these archives. We should all be able to access them. If we're unable to access most, if not all, of the riches locked up in these treasure troves, then it quite naturally begs the question, why are we paying for them to be preserved in the first place? This is about empowering people by providing them with material which may enhance their cultural awareness, their critical faculty and their creative skills. And maybe all of these and maybe more. But at the very minimum, they'll become that much more aware of the way in which media shapes the way in which they view the world. So when I joined the ABC as head of TV Arts in 2012, I was keenly aware that Whilst the ABC put huge resources in covering federal politics in Canberra, the federal arts institutions were receiving far less attention and engagement. And inspired by the BBC Creative Archive, ABC TV Arts and the National Film and Sound Archive brought together the National Collecting Institutions for a day to explore how we could all potentially create a portal in some way to leverage all of our digitised assets. Um, be they audiovisual media or sound recordings or digitised objects from the NFSA, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, the National Museum, the National Gallery, the War Memorial or indeed the ABC. And we were all hugely energised uh, by this idea and then funding <coughs> stepped in again, the environment dramatically changed and everybody's focus moved elsewhere. But I think it's got huge potential. Rick Prellinger uh, is the founder of the Prellinger Archives in San Francisco. Um, over 20 years, he and his wife Megan amassed a collection of 60,000 advertising, educational, industrial and amateur films, which individually nobody cared about. But together, they formed an extraordinary picture and story of American culture and history. The archive was acquired by the Library of Congress in 2002. Prelinger says that archives are a primary, primary weapon against amnesia. He's part, partnered with the Internet Archive to make over 6,000 films from the Prelinger Archive available for free online viewing, downloading and vitally for reuse. It's an incredible resource for researchers and practitioners, but also for the public. I should also highlight the amazing resource that the Internet Archive is. Um, they're, uh, again, based in the States um, and supported only through public don donations and uh, billionaire Brewster Carl's largesse. And they have rescued millions of pieces of footage, including international cable TV broadcasts of 9-11 as it happened, home and amateur movies, millions of books, 
thousands of video games, all of the tweets that celebrities and politicians try to delete. And they also back up most of the internet uh, with what they call, and it sounds slightly menacing, the Wayback Machine. It's such vital work preserving such an important and rich part of our contemporary culture and history, and it's doing what none of the public institutions have the resource or capacity to do at the moment. Removing barriers to be able to access these treasures and guard against our amnesia to mine these collections and remake them anew so that they're living and contributing to creativity today seems truly a magical thing. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at ACME at the moment. Um, we were established by the Victorian government in 2002 and we're currently closed, um, as Ross said, undertaking a $40 million renewal that we aim to transform our, transform our museum in a whole lot of ways. Um, we're creating all sorts of beautiful architecture and connecting the, the building um, in a far uh, better way, I think, to uh, enable visitors to truly understand that we are a museum with multiple um, outputs, outputs through our laboratories, our educational spaces, our exhibition spaces and our cinemas and social spaces. Um, and we're really aiming to become a, a leading 21st century museum globally in terms of our practice. Um, but, oh, and here's some, here's some pictures of our, what our permanent exhibition is going to look like soon. I'm not going to talk about that now. Um, but ACME originally grew out of uh, the State Film Archive, um, so or the State Film Centre, and that had the care of Victoria's uh, audiovisual ar archive, which is now 75, 80 years old. It's a small, um, quite idiosyncratic, but absolutely wonderful collection of over 170,000 media works that span 120 years. Um, it's got time-based media artworks, Australian video games, complex digital artefacts, lots of film of every single format, um, including many amateur and home movies. Uh, it's got magnetic tapes, optical media, uh, along with a whole lot of other kind of um, wonderful objects, um, pieces of technology, journals, costumes, physical artworks, and so on. As part of the renewal uh, that we're doing, um, we are creating a media preservation lab um, and this is going to be proudly sponsored by a company that's uh, kind of leading uh, the world in supporting practi practitioners around um, uh, digitising and preserving and caring for digital media and that's Blackmagic Design, a uh, company that comes out of Melbourne. Um, this Media Preservation Lab is a purpose-built glass-fronted laboratory um, which is going to be situated in our Federation Square foyer. Uh, it's going to highlight not just our collection, um, recognising that many people under the age of 35 will, for example, have never seen a piece of celluloid and have any understanding of the kind of materiality of that, that early uh, moving image um, technology. Um, but also, um, it's going to make visible to uh, our visitors the very act of preserving, the act of caring for audiovisual material. And, and we were just talking in the break before about, you know, there's this sense that we've got to urgently preserve these an analog materials. In fact, uh, celluloid is one of the most sort of stable and secure uh, storage formats that we have uh, of the moving image. And in fact, as we go through the 20th century into the 21st, tape is a nightmare let alone digital formats, um, which are so fragile. Um, and I think, I think it's going to be fascinating being able to look in and actually see this physical act of people preserving these, um, these materials. And they'll be embedded in a large cabinet of curiosities in our, in our foyer. And you'll see objects that we're working with and also films talking about the things that, the things that they're um, preserving. Because, of course... Um, you know, when you were talking, John, before about an archive, um, and it is uh, so much that stereotype of those those fusty boxes. But of course, the act of preservation is about people, and so seeing bringing that to life. Um, and for Acme, it's been hidden across Fed Square in a basement for the last 19 years. So we're going to continue to digitise our analogue materials um, with access as a key driver of what media items we choose um, in the political act of choice. Um, 
Uh, but we're also going to focus on the digital preservation of our time-based media objects and items and also particularly focus on video games. Um, like so many people working in the digital era, video games practitioners who tend not to be engaged in traditional institutions at all. They're very much startups out on their own. They're not even funded through the usual state mechanisms. They're not preserving their, uh, their work. How do we care for this incredibly important growing part of, of popular culture? Um, and what's important too is that um, this act of preservation um, for these digital items um, is a hugely complex task uh, because of course the rate of redundancy of both software and hardware means that a practitioner creating work for a very specific form of delivery, uh, those machines are not going to exist, they're not going to survive 50 years. How do we capture the original intent of the artist as they've created work in order to restore and represent the work on different kinds of uh, formats and, and technologies? So along with that kind of preservation work that we're really um, going to continue and, and bring to life, um, we're also going to highlight um, that digital preservation is really um, important to all of us. Um, it's not only important for discovering new work and ideas, um, but also for a creative engagement with our history. Um, and that digital uh, preservation isn't just for practitioners, for artworks, um, it's for content that's been professionally made. It's also really important for all of us and our collective uh, history. Um, beautiful uh, Super 8 um, films, uh, home movies, are going to be a key part of what we digitise and make available uh, to the public to be able to reuse. And they're on these fantastic uh, formats. But I've got a film of, of my child at age two, who's now 13, that I can barely play on, you know, MPEG or whatever it is. Um, how do we care for our collective memories? How do we, as individuals archiving our family history, preserve that? And I think that's a really important message that we certainly want to champion uh, as a museum. There's also going to be a, a lot of uh, research partnerships and we're really thrilled um, to be working with uh, the Art Gallery New South Wales, uh, Flinders University, RMIT, Swinburne University, State Library of South Australia, Griffith University and Experimenter Media Arts on a really wonderful ARC project right now entitled Archiving Australia Media Arts Towards a Method and National Collection. Um, I think there is a fever going on and thank goodness uh, it's a fever that needs to happen. Um, we're digitising our collection as quickly as possible uh, for re with reuse at the front of our minds um, and one thing that's happened over the last few years is a lot more home movies are being donated, uh, collections, stunning, beautiful uh, collections and we're now asking for all rights and we're being given all rights which is really uh, generous um, of uh, the owners of these collections and it will enable this kind of creative reuse that we've been discussing and just from a technical perspective um, as part of our, our work um, in our renewal um, Seb Chan who's leading our experience and engagement team is working with uh, a fantastic uh, technical team to create a sort of bespoke um, exhibition operating system that is going to uh, drive content around our ever-evolving permanent exhibition, feed it out into our post-visit websites and connect directly to Vernon, um, which we use as our, as our digital uh, collection uh, store. Um, and so all of those things will, will interface through the cloud. Um, and the other key thing, of course, with audiovisual material is how do we, um, once digitised, enable searchability in a, in a meaningful way. Um, the same technology that's being deployed in Hong Kong with facial recognition to quite terrifying effect can also be deployed uh, to very easily search digitised audiovisual collections. So once again, technology has this... Uh, double-edged sword. Um, so, imagine if our museums, galleries, libraries, archives and public broadcasters were properly resourced to increase the pace of their digitisation programs and we could together create a multidisciplinary living portal that our publics could then access for discovery, research, play, 
or to remake our memories. It really is a thrilling possibility and it's thrilling also to be here today to celebrate the launch of the Caldor Public Art Projects Digital Archives that enables access to the incredible artists, artworks and story it holds and I'm looking forward to the launch a little later today. Thank you. So rights is very important, yeah. and so you spoke about the Prelinger archive and uh, the Wayback Machine and, and so on, which um, uses that material for reuse and there are licensing um, rules that, that apply there. What approach are you taking to not just um, private work that's been given to Super 8, home movies and all of that. What sort of approach are you taking to digital rights management? It's really complex and of oh, course... Oh, sorry, I thought that it was easy. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. Damn. Damn. And, the, and also the rights, um, uh, sort of licensing and so on and, and rights, copyright law is quite different in Australia to America. Um, so we have a, a, a different environment and far less material is able to be made available here in the same way, um, unless it's in an in educational context or a crit and review and so on. So uh, in terms of being able to make things available for reuse, we absolutely have to have rights. Um, and fortunately, there is a, an openness and an enthusiasm from uh, a range of sectors, be they government agencies, and we have a lot of collections of government film, um, as well as um, amateur uh, filmmakers for their work to be creatively reapplied. And I think that's really fantastic, that kind of um, sharing and generosity and energy around that content that's been made. Yeah, great. We might pick up on some of that uh, conversation later on. So join with me in uh, thanking Katrina for her presentation. <laughs>
And in talking to Pat's archive, we can see some of the collecting patterns of the National Art Archive. When Richard donated Pat's archive to the then Research Library and Archive, her work was not held in the gallery's art collection. Um, and actually, we've only recently acquired two mixed media works by Pat through the gen generous donation of her friend Frank Waters. Um, when I put this together, I thought we were going to be in the domain, um, so you'd be a little further back from the full frontal nudity, so it's a little bit in your face, but that's part. Um, <laughs> so the collecting of artists and archives, um, either not or little represented in the art collection, is not isolated to Palata. While we've certainly collected artists, archives of artists well presented in the art collection, and it's important that we do that, we've also collected those outside it. We, we may ask why this is, and there are certainly some prosaic reasons for this, such as the availability of particular archives, but I think too that it could be that the very concept of an archive might allow for a broader remit than the curatorial collection. So perhaps we can see the archive win, within the gallery as functioning as a sort of social art history. Whatever the reason, we have collected the archives of artists oft ignored by the institution or accepted by the canon. And in turning our attention to the archive, we can begin to tell broader and deeper stories of Australian art, not only when it, when it comes to gender. Um, while not at parity, our archive collections have a far better ratio of female to male artists than the art collection does, but also to trace particular modes of practice such as performance and even conceptual art. As such, the archive not only has the capacity to provide a richer experience of works in the curatorial collection, but is sometimes the only experience we can provide of specific artists or practices, like Pat or um, the recently acquired Deluxe Media Arts Archive, which is part of the art project that um, Katrina mentioned. Um, and it's also not lost to me that when we acquire an archive, it becomes part of the institution. So the archive is just kind of on the outer edges of the institution, but we're still part of it. Um, so in broadening the concept of the collection, the broader gallery collection to embrace the archive, the gallery has recently introduced changes to the ways in which archives are collected, managed and used. These changes have brought the management of the archive closer to the gallery's broader collection management processes. And that includes the digitisation and eventual presentation of the archive online. So um, at the acquisition stage, any archives valued over $25,000 are now presented to the Board of Trustees and formally accessioned into the collection. Archival material is catalogued onto the gallery's collection management system, Vernon. Um, static material is digitised in-house by the gallery's photography studio. Time-based media is digitised via specialist service <coughs> providers. Um, loans of material from the archive to exhibitions, that's external exhibitions, must be approved and the material catalogued onto Vernon, where the exhibition is also recorded. Uh, reproduction of material from the archive for publication or other use is recorded through Vernon, and that involves our permissions and copyright teams. And the head of the library and archive attends exhibition meetings to consider how the archives might be included in future exhibitions and indeed to form entire exhibitions, which is what the Palata exhibition will do. Um, in making these changes, we're extending to the archive not only procedures reserved for the art collection, but also resources. They're very important. The registration, conservation, photography, copyright, exhibition and curatorial departments are now involved in the management of archival material. This is not to say that we haven't been digitising, cataloguing, using or exhibiting material previous to this, it's just that now those processes are being brought into line with those of the curatorial collection. Um, I was having a little think about, you know, the kind of digitisation that we were doing prior to sort of formally introducing these processes. And we've been doing a lot in the library and archive. It's just very kind of in-house. A lot of it's on demand, um, building in-house databases. We've got an in-house um, correspondence index that indexes all the gallery's institutional correspondence going back to the 1870s. There's now, I think, like 40,000 records in that. We're then digitising those letters on demand or ones that we think are important, and that's an ongoing thing. So it's not like we've just been sitting back and waiting for the gallery to kind of embrace us. 
Um, and, you know, we're still working through um, some of these new ways of managing the archive and how we fit into those traditional gallery models that are very often geared towards the individual art object rather than the very collective nature of archives. Um, and I think that cataloguing the archives has been where that's, you know, onto Vernon, the collection management system, um, has been where that's that's sort of hit us most and sort of rubbing up against that. So on to cataloguing fun times. Um, so we started cataloguing archival material onto Vernon about four years ago, and we've now got about 9,000 individual archival items catalogued onto the system. Um, and by cataloguing items onto Vernon, we're conferring a collection status on them, so it's definitely bringing them up in kind of importance in the eyes of um, colleagues um, and externally as well. Um, before this, we, like Alice did in Caldor, we had um, material in any one archive was listed and described through a traditional archival finding aid or manuscript guide with the contents described uh, to a box, folder and very occasionally item level. Um, we still make these and we will still probably make these. Um, they're useful for us even if other people don't find them useful. Um, yeah, so you know that's still going to be an integral part of our practice. Uh, we did have to work uh, quite a lot and we're still working with our collection system manager to develop cataloguing processes better suited to archives where the context um, and collective is important, you know, in that system that, again, is very much about the individual art object. Uh, so we developed a hierarchical cataloguing structure um, to reflect those archival practice practices um, and ensure that those connections are preserved. And it also means that we, um, we can create uh, connections not only within an archive, like across series, um, between other discrete archives, but also between the archive and the art collection. And that's really important when we've got a lot of material in the archive that, um, you know, refers to works in the collection, whether it's correspondence on acquisition from the artist prior to that, it was commissioned, um, sketches, maquettes, costumes, one in performances, all sorts of things that, you know, making those connections is really important. I'll just quickly run through how we do it so you get to see the delightful back end of Vernon. Um, I don't know quite how to use the pointer on this, but we basically have like a top level... I can show you. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Ryan. This one. Oh, thanks. I think I did. I well, now, sorry if I blind anyone with it. Um, it's only a laser. <laughs> so up here we have like a top level record for the archive. And then underneath we've got the series. So this is a really archival way. So some of you might be familiar, others not. Um, and then we drill down. So underneath each series up here, we've got the items that sit under that series. And then under the item, you can see the other records that have been linked. So this particular one here is a, um, an image in the Dora Olfsen archive. There are other works in the archive that are linked to that, but also curatorial collection, so artworks. Um, and actually upstairs at the moment, there's a really lovely exhibition on um, about a commission uh, that the gallery, or well, the gallery commissioned Dora Olsen to create a work that would go on the facade of the gallery. Um, she was commissioned in 1913. She worked on it um, from Rome for six years and then it was suddenly cancelled. So there's a really beautiful exhibition that reflects back on um, that commission, her archive, and then has engaged contemporary artists to um, respond to that and create a potential commission. So I'd encourage you to have a look, and it's got archives in it, so it's pretty cool. Um, so this is um, then the item level record. So it is very much still structured around um, how we would catalogue uh, an art object in the collection. Um, and we're still kind of, we're developing our own ways of, of fitting into that, but as, as well as manipulating the records, basically. Um, and it, it's interesting, I was again thinking about this yesterday, we've de the gallery's been working really hard on new ways of um, cataloguing and managing uh, complex multi-part works or uh, time-based artworks, and it's not dissimilar to the way that we're doing things with archives, which is quite interesting. Um, 
So is it art or is it archive? Hmm. Don't really have answers to that, but there's a bit of both in, in both collections. Um, so as in the Pat Latter <laughs> archive, many collections held in the National Art Archive include not only traces of artworks, but the works themselves. At times, works have been transferred into the curatorial collection, either at the point of acquisition or years later when an artist's work has undergone a reappraisal. This might be appropriate and have little impact on the particular archive, but oftentimes cherry-picking artworks can diminish the integrity of that archive um, and, you know, can result in loss of meaning, I would argue. And for some artists, the very nature of their work might mean that archival practices are the best way to manage their material, including artworks, or where that line between archive and artwork can be blurry. So artists like Pat's, whose work was so iterative, you know, you've got the films... Um, that then stills were created or performances that then were captured in, in photograph that she then made into screen prints or mail art. And so it's all this sort of constant use and reuse of works that she was making. Um, as you can probably guess, these have not been digitised. This is my crappy photography, just so I could show you some of the material we've got. Um, the male art collection is quite astounding. I think it's probably the biggest collection in Australia. Um, and also artists like Cathy Cavalieri, whose work is so bound up in her personal archive. There's some works from there. Um, it's also interesting to see that artworks in the curatorial collection also exist in the archive. <clears throat> so I've got two examples here of some posters that were prints made by uh, Bert Flugelman and we hold in the archive uh, both of these works um, and they're in the archive of Donald Brook um, and it's also for us to see how other institutions um, are cataloguing material into their art collection catalogues that we may not hold only in our archives but also in our library ephemera collection which also is a, an amazing um, source of material um, so that distinction between what is an artwork, what is an archive is often blurred. The line can shift um, and that line is also laden with value. Um, and in, in undergoing this kind of process of starting to catalogue and digitise um, material, these kind of issues are being made more visible and, um, you know, brought to the attention of the broader institution. So um, what I haven't mentioned, but is probably becoming more clear, is that the program of cataloguing archives onto Vernon is not exhaustive. Um, we have limited resources. We can't catalogue every item from each of our 400 collected archives, let alone our own institutional archive. Um, you know, I can't even really put a figure on how many objects we have. It's probably hundreds of thousands, probably millions of items. So necessarily that um, process is selective. I don't know if that's double violence when you select <laughs> the archive is selected and then you're selecting again for um, to, for stuff to go online. Um, but it is a real, it's an issue, you know. Um, how do we even prioritise what we do catalogue? Is it about, um, you know, material that dire relates directly to the art collection, material that's at risk of loss? I mean, that's super important, significance, lack of representation elsewhere. Um, and then there are archives we might digitise for preservation purposes, but not for access. Um, for example, we have um, an Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander audiovisual archive, which includes a large collection of artists' interviews and films. We've digitised this material, but it's not appropriate for that to be made openly accessible. Um, you know, access to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander archives need to be managed in a culturally safe and appropriate way. Um, and that's particularly important in a settler society like Australia, the sort of legacy of the colonial archive. Um, you know, just because material is held doesn't mean it should be openly accessible, whether it's digitised or not. Um, there are some really interesting projects that are happening in Australia. There's... Um, just to point out a couple, RA Richer, which is run by APY Communities, so that's a database that um, the community is in control of in terms of what goes on there, who has access. It's not openly accessible, but then within the community itself, there are differing levels of access depending on the material and whether it's appropriate that that person look at, at particular material. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean the other the other issue is also that by making some material available online we risk suggesting that that is the archive. Um, you know, as I said, the, the, the management of archives necessarily involves a process of selection, organising and description through finding aids and guides, activities through which the archivist's hand is always present. Um, so by only, only selectively making material available, we're adding another level of mediation between the archive and user. Um, and also when, you know, you've got pressure from uh, different departments to perhaps create narratives around material that you're putting online, that kind of goes quite against what, you know, as archivists and librarians, we're much more about handing over the material, and it's up to users to, to find those stories and tell, tell those narratives. Um, we don't really see that as our role. But I think too, we have to accept that in a digital world and when we're operating within an institution like the gallery, that perhaps there's sort of some midway point we can, we can act within. Um, so after discussing all of that, um, the material that we have been cataloguing, digitising is not yet available through our online collection. Um, I think the team who worked on the Caldor archive would probably, as you've experienced, it's an incredibly big um, project that needs a lot of resources and a lot of mapping out of, of how it's actually going to work. Um, yeah, so that that's a project that, that we're working on. Um, so watch this space. We did actually, um, a few years ago, we did release uh, archives through the online database, uh, the online collection database. Um, that was, it was up there for a very short period of time. Um, the records were taken down quite quickly due to a concern about the lack of distinction between the archive and the collection. Um, and also that the archive would swamp the art collection that the curatorial selection process would be undermined by all this other stuff. Um, and, you know, that those fears weren't entirely unfounded. There was, as I mentioned, there's, there was no web infrastructure to adequately manage the archival material. Um, however, it did really reveal um, value-based attitudes to the archive, which are now shifting, and I think part of this process um, that I've been going through has enabled that. You know, the, the archive collection um, is now considered more complementary rather than supplementary um, to the curatorial collection. Um, we did, sorry, I put this up a bit early, but we did actually um, release a selected, a very select group of artist archives onto the website last year. Um, so we started with these eight sculptors um, and then just providing, I mean, that's not, there's like about 40 records there under Bert Flugelman. It, it's very static, you can't search it, the connections between materials aren't there or the collection, but at least it's something and it's a start. Um, and people are using it and looking at it. Um, the Bert stuff's really cool if you want to have a look. Um, yeah, so um, here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, we've been experiencing a language shift from talking about the art gallery to the art museum. And I think that this works really well with expanded notions of the collection, where the archive is brought into the fold. And in being brought into the fold, the archive becomes a part of our exhibition making and tellings of Australian art. We can still categorise material according to its intent, its purpose, its relationship to an artist's work. But by including the archive in the broader collection, we can provide our audiences with a more meaningful experience of art. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire. Lots to think about, and um, we've got a chance for a couple of questions. I'm interested in the way that uh, artists who worked with mail art or correspondence mm. can kind of sneak their way into the archives mm. um, through other people's archives. Are there yeah. some examples about that you could speak about? Yeah, I mean, that's not um, isolated to someone like Pat's archive. There's sort of, you know, um, We've got a lot of commercial gallery archives, collectors, um, academics, even within art, individual artists' archives, you often find artworks or material from um, other artists. I think the mail art is really interesting because um, they were networks that were deliberately circumventing um, you know, those institutional art networks, either the commercial galleries or um, public institutions. 
And so, you know, even having it, like we, as I said before, we see ourselves as kind of, or have been on the periphery of the gallery, but having it now in an institution is quite interesting. Um, but I think a lot of mail art collections you tend to see in, in archives and libraries around the world. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about how um, in our Caldor archives there's, you know, letters that artists have sent with attachments with their photos of their own works and in that way they've sort of inserted themselves into our archives. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, that's why, like, we kind of call it in through the, you know, it's like getting in through the back door. <laughs> yeah. Um, and even, you know, just not even the archive, the library itself, we have this enormous co uh, collection of Australian artist files, so they're ephemera files. We keep everything. It doesn't matter if you were in one tiny exhibition or you won't even, you were just mentioned in the newspaper. We keep it all. So we've got now nearly 40,000 um, files on individual Australian artists. And that's only the solo files. I won't go through all the other ephemera files. But, you know, um, yeah, you can, there's different ways you can get into the institution. Yeah, if you want to. That was an awful lot of boxes we saw there. So um, thanks very much, Thank Claire. You. Please join me in thanking Claire for her presentation. And our last presentation for the day is from Louise Curran, uh, who's joining us today from the Centre for Creative and Cultural Research at University of Canberra. Uh, Louise is, in fact, an archivist. She says that she was an archivist, but I think she still is an archivist and an artist. And many of you will know that she's uh, one of the members of the Teaching and Learning Cinema Collective. And today her talk is really going to think a little bit about how there are some things in a database, some things in a collection that we can't digitise. So please join me in welcoming Louise. Okay, well, it's an honour. It's strange, there's so many people in this room who should be here giving this talk. So I'm going to speak on behalf of all of you. Um, so, uh, it's important to me that I too acknowledge that I'm here to do some cultural work on Aboriginal land, where cultural work has happened for more generations than I can make sense of. So I want to acknowledge the Gadigal traditional owners who never ceded this land, and I pay my respects to any Aboriginal people present, and especially to Elders and to Elders past who cared for this place. Okay. The wisdom travels with the object. This is a big title. It seems like the wisdom referred to in this statement must be metaphorical. So my aim is to lift this out of the domain of metaphor into a territory that is practical and actionable. So we presume that digital can save everything. Our everyday experience suggests even if we don't save it, we could. And when we get a 404 error on the internet, or the emails before 216 have all been deleted by the university, we still have a sense that they could have been saved if only they'd been cared for better. The problems of keeping digital stuff are well understood. They rely on software and hardware to perform, so you, you, know, you need your USB key, you need your Microsoft Word, we know all that. They need constant updating to keep them usable. Most of the time, the digital object on its own is not self-explanatory. We need its metadata to understand it. And we've got Malcolm Turnbull to thank for our understanding of metadata. Um, many digital objects are parts of a bigger whole. Think of one page of a website or a work of media art. Now, many of you in this room have a film background. We natively understand this because we know that the work consists of so many different elements, especially those of us who started in analogue. So just reflect on that. The other thing with digital is that there's such a lot of digital stuff. I find it useful, useful to characterise the care these things need as not so much preservation, but helping them transform over time. So that's not my idea. That comes from a Dutch project, and that's a young woman called Seneca Stichter. So I'll just say that again. So it's about transforming over time. 
So addressing any of these six problems that I just listed results in change, and change means decisions. So standards have evolved to cover some of those changes, which takes, takes the pressure off those of us who actually have to deal with these problems. But in reality, how deep to archive the website becomes a subjective call. And the dark arts of selection, which is kind of featured today, uh, appraisal in the archives parlance, is principles based, but in practice it becomes a mix of personal interpretation and resource limitations. Mm -hmm. And I feel very well qualified to say that because that has been part of my professional work for a really long time. So we have to make decisions. Those decisions are going to be visible to others. We've all looked on Pandora and been disappointed that the 1996 website we wanted to look at gives us just the look and feel with, with most subpages not accessible. And those decisions we make mean, so I think about four of today's speakers have talked to that theme of how these political actions, these decisions about what we do, reveal stuff about our institutions, about ourselves, through the priorities those decisions reflect. So, for instance, is a government archives at one point trying flat content-only preservation of websites, doing nothing to keep the look and feel? The communication of the aesthetics is gone, a significant loss in my opinion. But equally, the 404 errors at greater depths within the sites, we want to know what it said, not just what it looked like. So these decisions reveal institutional views and I think many who've actually dealt with the real work of doing this, they also reveal individual views. So we have to have opinions in the digital more than we had to have before digital. Whether we stand, so in paper, for example, there were standardised processes for decisions about preservation, the decisions were less visible. Now we've still got those standards for the digital, but they, there are many, and many of them shift. They, they are less fixed, in my view. Audiences notice our decisions. They become part of their experience. So that's partly why Katrina's decisions around displaying preservation are so interesting. People want to know what happens in the back room. And audiences can read that when they experience the exhibitions we, we uh, prepare for them. So for example, we go to box one in Michael Landy's piece, the Christo work, and we can see the archives on the wall. We notice the whole punch, but we know those archives are not original. But we would have liked, maybe we can send Michael a note via the editor in Extra Extra to say, dear Michael, could you please put a caption next time so that you can declare that you actually copied that, stamped a hole in it. Um, so what's the implication of subjective decision making visible to our audiences? I think it means we have to let our audiences know about these decisions. So that's the point I just made. Some of my crossover archives creative work deals with this. Okay, so I forgot to ask Ross how I actually drive this. Yeah, so just what do I do? This button. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. No. Thanks. Okay. okay. So uh, some of yeah. So uh, I haven't really given you my credentials, but Ross kind of gave them. So part of, one of one of my creative works in the archives field is with my colleague Lucas Eileen as teaching and learning cinema. And we made a manual documenting our experience reenacting a seminal media art performance from the 70s. So this is a manual. Our authority to make a manual for someone else's artwork was that it documents our experience. It's our tale of use. So that's one way to handle this subjective preservation and surface it for an audience, is through claiming your own. There's some, some users of the manual. We'll come back to that. And here's another one. In another project, the Stand and Lab, the audience observed me and colleagues devise and test instructions for a 16 mil film performance. So the audience saw the score, which is what you see here with the haiku beneath, shot five, etc. And you'll see here on the right is the artist, we're very dark, but there's Lynn Liu, who's a British Singaporean artist, and I working on the first draft of the score on her computer. And what the audience experienced was the evolution of the score as a series of testers actually tried it out. So this is really in the vein of Katrina's idea of putting these processes before our publics. So my next heading is things need context. 
So this is quite interesting because this is kind of quite a different perspective from some of what we've heard so far. So there are many digital resources that we encounter flat via an internet search. Our search brings us to matches and we evaluate them against our search with rudimentary criteria that we've got about the context of that result. So we sort of go, yes, that's a good match. My definition of archives is information and context. The point at which archives differentiate themselves from a keyword search on the internet is exactly that point. For me, archives are an accumulation and that's what makes them interesting. They're links within, between, among. Archivists toil at keeping context intact and there are those who say the Google searcher doesn't care, so why bother? But for me, I want to know why they were made. What was that person up to? What did they make them for? Um, and I've made a note for myself here that that's, that's the point in the two ontological principles for archivists, which is original order and providence. So those are kind of the two mantras that archivists repeat, original order, provenance. And so what that means is that the way you organise stuff is about the action. So it's all about the imaginary filing cabinet and being able to open the imaginary, fi imaginary filing cabinet and imagine what that set of actions was that gave rise to this piece of evidence. And that word evidence is very important in this situation, which resonates slightly differently from this domain that we're talking in. Okay, so I've said we toil at keeping things in context. Okay, so there's lots of scholarship about why these points of contact matter. And Laura Stoller springs to mind. She's the along the archival grain woman. So, and what she asks us to do is to learn to read the archives as an entity. And it's then that we can really understand what they don't say or what they obscure. So for those of us in Australia, that's particularly important because there is so many important, so much important stuff that just is not within the texted and recorded. Um, and the other there is that everything is, con in con everything is in contact. And Ross Gibson is eloquent about that. And my reading of his analysis of that is that it's the infrastructure of the archives that has the potential to put everything in contact. But I also read that as a broader, which we will, you, you'll see my point in a moment, these circles emanate outwards. And indeed it's really quite a, that's the juice of the digital, is what does everything in contact mean? So that's the point that no, Nicole was making, really, anyway. Okay, so we know all the problems with archives meaning. So now I'm going to bravely face up to Foucault and Derrida. Okay, so you can give me a crit on this. So Foucault, here we go. You can only utter it if you've got the framework to make the utterance in the first place. And that framework is the archives. And there is power and control in being the one who sets up the framework. And Derrida... The archive is three things. House arrest, the terms of arrest set by those with the power to create the house. There are conflicting forces in archives. The archival principle wants to keep stuff and the archivalithic drive wants to destroy and disorder. Pressing save is a letter to the future and a force that looks forward. So that's my reading of the great metaphors of archives. Remember, I'm kind of against the metaphor, so I had to put this in. Okay, so there's a good reason for that that is beautifully summed up by the beautiful Australian historian, Australian historian Greg Denning, which is that practitioners often can't see themselves. For example, his example is philosophers of history. They can't see their own work. And I think that is very true for the two great keepers of the metaphors about the archives. So archives is information and context. The richer encounter with archives consists of taking account of their wider meaning. Why does that matter? It matters because that context, those linkages that make up the wider meaning, can be described. In other words, we can write them down, but they also escape even evade description. 
Now you've pretty much seen that when you looked at Claire showing us the entries in Vernon. That's what she's got to work with. So it seems a pretty big ask that that is going to capture all of that stuff that we need. Okay, so we can't describe them completely. We can't exhaust that translation representation of those relationships when we write it down. So this is why I'm an advocate of body-to-body -body transmission, transmission in person from one person to the next. But Tino Segal gives us a very interesting outlier example of body-to-body -body alone with no aid memoir. So a quick Google brings us to various depictions of this is so contemporary, despite Segal exhorting us not to document. So in the 1980s, living history was big in some places. You could visit museum, museums and encounter people making an effort to run the algorithm of a particular historical past, often colonial. Amongst the problems with this was a boundary issue. So just over the hill was an early mobile phone tower, or the guests would turn up in shorts and thongs. I see it that it's kind of the same for This Is So Contemporary. The YouTube clip is just there. So body only with no aid memoir looks unrealistic because others will make the AIDS memoir if we don't. So we can't really slip out of it that way. So I'm an advocate for both recordings and transmission in person. To explain why, I'm going to say it again slightly differently. Archives are information and context. That context is where the main game is, where most of the meaning is made. It's that who, what, when, where, why about the flat record that gives it its properties as evidence, makes it an, an authentic and reliable record for the purposes of evidence. That who, what, when, where, why is told at two levels, at the level of the individual document as metadata, an upper level at the level of, say, for example, John Caldwell's file about the Christo project, another level, files about the public projects in, gen in general versus files about the textiles business, for example. So we're imagining John's office in 1969, how did he organise things? We can ask him later. OK. Um, so the archives field has a model for this interleaved knowledge, which is called the records continuum. Okay, so the records continuum is on my side of that screen. Uh, well, and a British blogger's version of it. So there are two key concepts in archives that come from Australia's particular environment. One is the record series. So you saw that in Claire's slide. She showed you, she said, this is like archival special secret business. <laughs> so and she showed you all those series. So that is a peculiar Australian um, means of ordering archives. So it's got a particular ontology that goes back to Gough Whitlam. So one of Gough's legacies was that there were so many changes, administrative changes in government that happened so fast that we had to come up with a better way than just who created the records. And that was, what were they doing at the time? So that's what series control is. So that's a little aside. That's not essential to my point. But my real point here is, here's the second great contribution of Australian archives theory, is Frank Upwood's diagram of the records continuum. So what this does is help us visualise what happens at Derrida's save. And the significance of this diagram is that it interleaves life and archives, where other models put the archives at the end of the life cycle. Upwards is a, upwards is a rich model that really interleaves that point of creation with the different phases, the different ways in which we use archives. What interests me about that diagram is the past and the, the interpenetration, the, the absolute interpenetration of the present and the past. So there are means to record context. So what, what, what Upward is really describing is the contextual environment of a piece um, of recorded information. In his instance, that's what he was conceiving of. That idea's been updated by Laura Miller, a Canadian archivist, who's all for this concept of evidence. Because evidence, every culture, every cultural group has its own expression of evidence. And in her formulation, that's the most useful way for us to conceive of this material that we specially want to keep. And what Upwards Diagram does is show you how that fits in, how that, how that kind of all fits together. 
Okay, so I'm going to move forward because otherwise you'll just fixate on Frank. Okay, so there are means to record that context. There are standards. There are record-keeping standards, standards used by registrars for artworks. Almost every discipline has standards for their data, so every corner of science has a special set of metadata to describe, describe their data. Um, but my argument is that the metadata never exhausts all the context. It never tells you all the who, what, when, where, why. And we saw that in Frank's diagram. So there are so many ways for this stuff to mean. And I think all museum workers would agree with this, that we find that what we find in the files tells us only so much about the artwork's last outing or exhibition it was part of. We hope it tells enough, but we accept it won't tell everything. And when it does a good job, then it becomes hard to know what's the significance of that information. So that is another experience I faced with Lynn and my work with the Stanton Lab was how was I how could I decide which shots mattered from you'll see on the on my side of the screen that big printout is the first score. There were 40 shots of which I, I kind of had to follow these instructions. Did all those instructions matter? It turned out they didn't. There were some that were more important than others. But the only way that I could kind of elus el elicit this from Lynn was through, was through being with her, basically, being taught by her. So that is my small metaphor for this problem of we get the flat archive. How do we make sense of what matters more? So we've evolved means to record bodies, oral histories, video recordings, but those things fix things in time. This is a moot point. If we fix things in time, we can point to it. Our, for instance, if Trump had emailed the Ukrainian president and we could prove the authenticity that it actually was Trump's email, that the material properties of that were what we thought, it, what, he's, what it really was, and the re reliability that no one had actually changed the content of, of his words within that email, um, and we do that through the metadata, and that is the whole process of formal record keeping to retain those properties of evidence. Um, what's and how they've been kept in a more common parlance, it's basically their biography. The downside to fixing things in time is that they can't evolve. And what we know about the digital is that it must evolve. And so there's the tautology. Trump's email must evolve, but still stay Trump's email. Pike's TV cello, for those of you who've seen the relevant box in Michael's work, um, must stay the TV cello. And I'm not sure if Asti's sharing is actually in the room, but the, the, the conservators here have done lots of work on that particular piece. And there's a whole body of activity in the last five years looking at Namjoon Pike as this conservation headache, partly because his view was, what a great idea, why don't we try it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so Pike, it, Pike's TV cello must still stay the TV cello, but also evolve. So in the case of my work with Lucas Teaching and Learning Cinema on our manual, the manual, Man with Mirror must evolve. Let's see if we can find those. There they are. But it also needs to stay Man with Mirror. So another discovery from my work with Lynn was that she couldn't articulate, she could articulate what she didn't want. But some of the instructions, instruction testers came up with future ways to use her work she hadn't thought of. So that's the Pike problem. Great idea, why don't we try it? Yeah. So she could still recognise her work and those suggestions, but it wasn't until she was faced with this thought about the future, about what the archive offered, that she all of a sudden was like, ah, that's a good idea. And in fact, some of these suggestions amplified her idea. So it paves the way for an unexpected evolution, but one that still pays attention to the rules and rigours of the work, even though pinning down those rules and rigours, or the DNA as TLC calls it, can be harder than what we thought. So this is the thing that the whole thing is evolving. But I digress from wisdom. I said these things need context to stay usable, which means both people and things are needed. Their wisdom must stay alive. What do I mean by wisdom? Meaning one, there are objects whose primary importance lies in their biography, the story that goes with them. 
This is what makes them important and meaningful. Anthropology and museum studies have well-developed literature about object biography. Stories may be about objects' life history, traditional clothing, for example, suitcase of a refugee, carefully and occasionally worn in a new setting. There are other objects, a loom or a steam engine, for example, um, that shed light on a bigger process. There are other objects whose meaning is revealed, r revealed through performance, for example, a database. The records are brought to life within the database. We understand the record unintelligible on its own is a title, and when linked to other records, we can understand it describes an object in our museum, linked to the fields like who acquired it, and we've seen that both from Alice's um, showing us the living, the Calder archives, and from Claire. So, um, and as I've said, this is the lifeblood for archivists, trying to set information in its context robust enough to communicate to future users. In TLC's work on the user's manual, the manual tries to set down the experience of Man with a Mirror with the intention that someone else can produce it by following the instructions in the manual. So, what I've discovered is that yes, the instructions can be followed, and here's some people following the manual, and there is contextual information to help, but not everything you need to know is accounted for. It's this excess, what you need that's not present in the instructions that I'm calling the wisdom. Okay, you don't know what's missing until you try it. So far, what's been needed is different for each user, each person who's tried this manual. So my proposition is that by finding a mechanism to capture this experience and add it to the heritage item, it will A, be more useful in the future, B, shed a light on that specific user, give them, them a reason to attend closely to their own experience with that item. Okay, meaning two, through experience we learn and adjust. Wisdom is when we exhibit those adjustments. So in my case, the record about the experience of this artwork must have a form that can adjust over time. As Lucas said at one point while we were doing this work, the artwork we are dealing with gains growth rings like a tree does. Each experience of the work adds a ring. Those rings literally become additions available to future users through additions to the manual. By adding those tales of use as growth rings, they strengthen the work over time. So this chimes with preservation theory that, focuses that, that the focus of conservation would do well to shift ensuring an artwork's progression and time rather than its conservation. So that's the point I start with, that we're all about progression. What an artwork can be, ca can be is set up by what it has been in the past. So there's lots of archives of preservation theory about that, conservators talking about the importance of the archive, and Hannah Holling is someone whose work I really love about that. But what my work adds to that is it can also surprise us. If we follow its rules and rigours, the divergences, the necessary divergences, can surprise us. And they're both a printout for what's possible for the work also what's possible for that user and that user can be a whole accumulation. So consulting a definition offered by the Oxford Re Reference for Philosophy I find a definition for wisdom which is traditional goal of, it's the traditional goal of philosophy. It's considered an amalgam of knowledge, spiritual profundity, stoical, stoical ability to put up with the evils of the world and wisdom relevant to practical action. So this business about trying it out is really important. We don't know what it's going to deliver until we try it. Wisdom is derived from a crude experience and that experience is best captured and stored, at best captured, stored and communicated as narratives. So that's what you're seeing here. That manual is a narrative. It's a tale of experience of one set of users of someone else's artwork. It's then being used by another set of users who are going to contribute their tale of use back again. And what underpins that is the effort to do the work to identify the rules and rigours, which is different from the DNA, um, because it can change. To have wisdom is to have a thick and well-tested set of lived experiences, and they work out in an ascending order of difficulty and complexity, data, information, knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Okay, I conclude. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks very much, Louise. So with that, Louise has got the mic and she's going to move over here together with all of our panellists. So we're going to go straight into our panel discussion, but starting with the first question for Louise from her presentation. Oh, look, that was just so fascinating because, um, I mean, that unexpected evolution, I love that turn of phrase. Did you want to sort of expand upon that, Louise? Um, look, yeah. yeah, I do. So right now, you, we've had two weeks of saturation about unprecedented, yeah? Unprecedented fires, unprecedented conditions. Uh, we've got expectations about the past and what the past will deliver us. And we've had those expectations based on our experience of the archives, of what the archives can deliver us. We are reaching a point where what is available digitally is different from what it's been before. And we don't, it's, so this is an opinion, but my opinion is that we don't actually know how it's gonna to come together. My experience, so what my evidence has shown me is that those accumulations, what, what actually happens when you use this stuff is quite different from what you anticipate. Because people have to grapple with their own, so for example, in my case of reenactment, we have to deal with our own techno-cultural situation. What kind of equipment can we get? Can we get the Super 8 projectors? It just so happens that we can, because I'm a Super 8ist. But there are others who can't get their Super 8 project, who, who, for whom that's not achievable. The guys from New Zealand that you were seeing before, standing in the garden. Their solution to that work, which was originally a Super 8 work, was to use, as they said, a manky TV with a cobbled together webcam using a 1986 ThinkPad. So that was their decision. Now, it wasn't that they sought to author that. They didn't set about diverging from Guy's original piece. They set out to replicate Guy's piece, to actually try to produce it to produce their own experience of it. But their situation led them to conclusions that they couldn't predict. So this unprecedented... So I guess my point is the archives can surprise us. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Louise. Great answer. So um, questions from the floor, either for Louise or for anyone on the panel. And while people are thinking, well, okay, hands are already up, so I think we've got one over here, Richard, and then I think Stephen. Or Stephen and then Richard, either way. Whoever gets the mic first, it's a battle for the mic. Thank you all for fascinating um, things. This is just a very specific one for Katrina, actually. Um, given your expansion of... Uh, of archiving of film material, how do you separate, what's the difference between your vision for ACME and the National Film and Sound Archive? And do they, because we, you know, in Sydney we don't have that, so you're a very unique institution, yes. but you're in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah and um, they're very close partners with us, and in fact we cohabit in Melbourne, um, in the same office space. Um, and we have different remits. I mean, they are the National Film and the Sound Archive. We are the holder of an expanding uh, state film archive. But as I said, it's quite idiosyncratic and unusual in terms of the content. It's, it's in some ways, certainly the early materials are very uh, Victoriana focused, as in the state of Victoria focused. Um, there's a lot of kind of experimental work in there um, and uniquely there's a collection of uh, 80s and 90s video games um, and I think recently announced uh, NFSA. So an example is National Film and Sound Archive have recently announced that they are now interested in moving into the space of um, preserving for and caring for uh, video games which is fantastic. So we are going to be working with them to develop a strategy that is complementary rather than um, duplicating. Um, our collection expands in terms of art, principally around our commissioning program and through donations that we receive at the moment, principally through artists. Um, the, uh, as I said, the home movie collection is vastly expanding. Um, 
And um, yeah, so I, I think it's complementary, essentially, but we are certainly never going to be in the space of collecting new Australian narrative feature films or, or docs or um, television drama or anything like that. That is not our space, um, but we want to work with the NFSA uh, around these ideas of creative reuse, which we are super excited about, and this uh, increasing focus we have around sort of more specialised time-based media preservation. Thanks, Katrina. I think Stephen had a question over here. And if you're thinking of asking a question, just raise your hand and I can... Um, this is... There's been a... How do I start this? A convergence... Or no, actually, there's been a divergence um, in the last sort of 50 years or even longer between within art and technology from the media that are actually used to represent it or to present it and from and the um, content in a sense. Now there's a lot of art and technology where the medium or the carrier and the content are identical, um, especially early art and technology and we could actually take that right back to Alexander Hector in um, the tens or twenties in, in Australia with his light organs and things like that. Um, but then there's Frank Hinder's light boxes from the mid, uh, early, uh, late, uh, late fifties through to about 1974 or three or something, um, which I had a lot to do with in, uh, re restoring uh, in earlier period. Um, then there's things people work like Stan Ostojkowski's work, um, where he made. Um, used various kinds of technologies to do performance work and other sorts of things, um, his theremins and so on. What are we doing or, or um, about the maintenance and preservation of the hardware that is specific to that technology to, to those, that content that you are mostly talking about here. And I know that this is crossover with a conservation problem. So thanks, Stephen. It's a simple question. Um, we're expecting a simple first. answer right, I've got the microphone. from our panellists. OK, you ready, Stephen? Yeah, go for it, Louise. Okay, and then well, we'll I think, um, Stephen, John. someone needs to write the history of that, and I think that someone <laughs> is you. Uh, that's I too think, easy an answer, I think John. You've, you've already done half the history. In terms of the actual technical preservation, Katrina might have something to say well, based on what she showed us before. Yeah, no, and it's super, super tough and there's hardly anybody um, who's focusing on that area. And not only that, the kind of the, the boffins, if you like, the, the, the tiny little computer fix-it companies who are looking after that hardware are closing down. Um, they're getting too old. Also well prior to computers in Totally. Well, that's what I mean. Well, projectionists, for example, in terms of old school projection technology. I mean, it's it's really hard, and they, these are specialists um, who are who are not who don't have apprentices, uh, and are, you know the knowledge is kind of disappearing, and it's it's really difficult. We've we've just been through a process with Troy Innocent, um, and we worked with Gribwaite, uh, University of Melbourne, through their. Um, Centre for Conservation, uh, and they are training up a whole lot of people who are literally pulling apart old machines, you know, 15, 18 year old machines, and trying to rebuild them so that CD ROM works and play again in the way that the artist originally intended. Now, I'm talking about computers again, but they're learning on the spot. And it's the same with um, our preservation team, and it's, it's a massive challenge, and it's becoming more and more urgent to be addressed we will be addressing it in a very small way. And, and of course, the, the bridge between the two is the videotape recorder because, of course, that's where so much of the work was um, documented and, and also it's where so much of the work was actually made and shown. And uh, Stephen's just... And, nine, and the Biennale, second Biennale in 1976, which was... And, and, you know... And the Ewing Gallery in Melbourne and the things that they were doing there. Well... For example, VHS players. Anybody wants to donate a, a VHS player that works to Acme? We're happy to receive it at any time because they're falling like flies. So th I think we might just go to Louise. So I yeah, think I, wanna, to I just want to add one point. So I, I, my, I, I live with a conservator 
And he says to me, why are the Conservatives getting PhDs in, in droves? And I, my answer to him is that it's because they have to grapple with this mix of where actually is the artwork? Where is it? Is it in the media? Is it in the, like, where does it reside? And in fact, Asti and Caroline wrote an article by that very title just last year, uh, talking about their work with the Pike piece. So I think that this, this, there are lots of brains working on this very question. And in my opinion, uh, the split between the carrier and the content is certainly not a foregone conclusion. And it's a real, uh, you know, I'm the body-to-body -body person. I'm all for the carrier and it's, it's where it plays a role. That role needs to continue because that's part of how the work means. And I think everybody would nod and agree with that. So, yeah, anyway. So I, just yeah. to respond, I, um, I was actually the person who originally um, installed and uh, the TV cello and used to maintain it during or for many years afterwards and then I was the person who built the TV Buddha from um, the TV that Pike found in a pawn shop in the cross um, B-A-W-N that is um, and um, <laughs> um, given the cross um, but um, and you know for example I don't know what Asti and, and so on have done. No one has asked me, and I'm the carrier of all the knowledge about that, no one has ever asked me about the conservation of that object, you know, at all. And so I don't know whether people really understand where, their, where the history really lies. It lies in the minds of the individuals who are doing the work originally. Uh, maybe microphone. Yep. Um, I was at a conference last year where you raised that question to Asti, and she said that she had spoken to you and visited you. So I just no, we'd spoken about the conservation of the videotape collection okay. that I had. We had not spoken about the, um, the, the TV show or the TV at all. Okay. So there's another question up the back here, and I think this is raising lots of questions about how we work with the production of knowledge, which is um, in people's lived experience, but also in the mechanisms that transmit the works and then the way in which um, archives um, help us to remember and reactivate. Um, I'll go to Scott. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, two themes that I noticed threaded through a few of the presentations today was the question of the politics of the archive and secondly, um, the uh, the use, the idea of the use of the archive and particularly how new uses might be opened up by the different digitisations of archives. I'm just wondering if anybody wanted to reflect on uh, whether there are any more ethical, or more political uses of the archive than others. It seemed there was a, a bit of a suggestion of the benefit of a creative approach to re reactivating the archives and I just thought that might be something somebody wanted to respond to. Who's going to go first? Alice, is that you with the mic? I can I see. I mean, one thing that sort of raises with the politics is, um, as was sort of alluded to before, to be able to publish things online requires, you know, the permission of the artists. And I think an interesting issue that we have at Caldor is that we really want to put things in the hand of, hands of the public and we're able to do that online because we have these ongoing relationships with artists but with the copyright laws in Australia it's actually very challenging to transfer that ability to create to you know people that access the archives like we can kind of negotiate you know through personal relationships about how the archives are used for projects that we instigate or are involved with but um yeah, actually transferring permission is not something that we really can do. Yeah, Katrina, did you want to um, add further comments? Well, uh, I, there could be no. You could say no. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, I think it's just important to note that there are... Um, that idea of reuse applies to some elements of an archive. So if you look at the ABC archive, there are some elements of the archive that are ripe for the plucking. And then there's a heap that you would never ever go near for a range of reasons. And some of them about copyright, some of them about 
moral rights and ethics and you need to think that through very carefully and that always comes down to the relationship of trust with whoever is the owner or donor um, of, of that material. So, um, but but I what I love about that idea of the creative archive is that dynamic relationship with the public, whoever they are, and that bringing to life something that, um, that it gives it a second life that I think is really thrilling. And um, technology enables that in a way that, that liberates that material to, to be reborn um, while fulfilling a whole lot of the kind of remit of the institution that's holding it in terms of what you're offering your public um, and experience. And that idea of reimagining memory I think is really beautiful too. And, but that only applies to particular things. And I think we have to be, there's no blanket approach to this. Yeah. And uh, Claire, did you have the mic in hand for an answering opportunity? <laughs> Go for um, it. No, I'm, quite, I'm interested in the, the politics of the archive and coming from an institution and how when an institution collects an archive, depending on what it is, you know, you're institutionalising, you're colonising that archive and, and how do you kind of um, manage that with some, you know, like I think Indigenous archives are a really good example. Um, we here in the gallery hold um, the Papunya Tula archive, Art Centre archive. Um, we don't own it. We're um, custodians of it. Um, and that's a, an ongoing relationship with the art centre. Um, I went to a, a, um, a talk on Saturday at Cross Art Projects about Womanifesto and what's happening with their archive. That's being digitised by the Asia Art Archive. The physical archive is being handed back to the collective. And I, so I kind of like that sort of um, network of support rather, I mean, as collecting institutions, we're all very much about what can we get? What, like, because it also makes us look good. <laughs> really, when we, you know, might collect certain archives. So, you know, how we can perhaps support or create a network of support for, you know, particularly collectives, community organisations, um, you know, people who have deliberately worked outside the institution as well, which is kind of, you know, going back to the mail art stuff is sort of, it's a little ironic that it then becomes part of the institution. That, that's um, true. Yeah. So I think um, Nicole had a uh, response and then we've got another question over here. Okay. Look, I think um, I think Foucault had it right when he says that politics isn't hierarchical; it's not vertical, right? So, in that sense, um, I th and I also think what Katrina was picking up on there was that politic politics is multi-dimensional, and um, having the Caldor Art Project just digitised and made um, accessible to the general public. You could say it's a democratisation in some sense, right? Where you're allowing a lot of people to access that. But it, it's also an undermining of the politics of the institution. And I think that's, that's a really interesting um, means of opening it up to just n not ownership, just by a particular institution. So. Yes, can I just add one more thing? On you can, with the microphone, okay. John, and then we'll hand yeah, over to um, the, the yeah. a question um, over here. We'll finish there. up with the politics. <laughs> um, it seems to me in the internet age there are two um, contrasting drives. One is the drive to transparency and the other is to drive to preserve privacy. And part of um, a public, um, publicly um, made available on the uh, internet archive, as we've done, is to make things transparent and make them available as a public resource. And that's always been seen as a public good in itself. It's ever since the dawn of the age of internet. So much so that people like um, Zuckerberg of Facebook argued for the benefit of networking, making everything transparent as a good in itself, and privacy was demonised. In fact, there was some um, suggestion that privacy doesn't exist anymore in the age of internet, and probably if Facebook and Google had their way, it wouldn't. However, um, there's been a reversion probably to an emphasis on the right to privacy. Certainly Google have been attacked on that in Europe, and Facebook have come in into terrible flack, and there's been a backlash against um, 
big tech in general in the last few years on that very principle of privacy. And I think we, we were seeing that to some extent in what we were making available in the Calder archive. I know Alice would always say to me, oh, we've got to redact this, we've got to not, not make this public. And I'd be getting a bit frustrated and I'd say, no, put it all up. We want it, everything public. I realise there are those contrasting uh, tendencies and we have to respect people's right to privacy, which is what we're doing, until we can be sure that um, there's permission to um, make these things public. Sorry, Ross, before we move on, I just yep. have to add a Go comment Louise. because I, I'm conscious that Julia Mant is here, who's the, the, um, who is the president of the Society of Archivists. So it's important I say something to this topic, and I think that Katrina summed it up when she said that there's some material at the ABC that you would never go near allowing to circulate with the energy and enthusiasm that she has portrayed in her vision for the kind of archives she would like to see happen. So that was my point about the context. For some material, it's essential that it retains those interrelationships. It's who, what, when, where, why. And there's an ethical responsibility to do that. And um, that's probably a really important distinction for all of us to take away from this conversation because we sort of, the flat archive of Google leads us to feel like everything is fair game. But we all have instances where everything is not fair game. And it shoots both ways. It shoots towards what we take from the archives, but it also shoots from the, at the moment, parlous state of responsibility by those who have authority to actually do their bit to put entries into the archives, which is the other side of this conversation about the role that evidence plays in democracy. So I'm kind of channeling Laura Miller there, so you can check her out on the internet. She's A.R. Miller, and see her whole argument about the importance of evidence and the importance of making evidence available and the role that plays in a democratic society. So, um, but really the key point I would love for you to take is Katrina's, that if you go into the ABC archives, there's some stuff that just has to stay linked to its, 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 its world and can't be served up flat. Thank you, Louise. Question from the floor. So my question relates to the future of archives and I wanted to play off Katrina's point that um, it's dynamic and Nicole's point that um, we need to democratise it and I think things that others have said here about privacy as well. Um, so my question is um, that the New York Public Library has made much of their digitisation open to the public to tag and to have input to as does Trove, um, and I wonder what you all think about the future of that for archives. So if people have an experience with an item or a project, what is the ability in the future to add that um, information? Yeah, who wants to tackle that one? So tagging, meta-tagging, <laughs> wisdom of the crowd, um, Trove is a great example. There was a great um, thing, and I can't remember the name of the show, but um, muse the Melbourne Museum did it around the centenary of World War One, and they built a street um, in Melbourne, and a lot of individuals on that street were called up, and many of them never returned, and they did a kind of history of what happened to that street over a long, over generations in relation to that experience of people going and being killed. And they didn't have the evidence, so they asked for the people of Melbourne and the people in that street to contribute to that story, and that's what the museum became. And that is such an interesting point. They're doing, you know, increasingly in um, natural history museums, you know, citizen scientists who are going out and recording frogs, for example, in their back gardens or bird birds. And I, I think that's one of the most fantastic things about the democratisation that's enabled through technology is that you can start having these layers that are beyond the expert voice and are about bringing together evidence by a community and telling stories by a community and I think that sort of shared voice is not to say that we don't need the export, expert voice and I'm passionate about the role of the curator and the programmer and the choices that 
have to be made, I think. Um, uh, I think have become even more important as we have this endless choice. But I think that that layering and that ability to share the storytelling and enhance it by a chorus of voices enriches um, our capturing of our collective memory in an inspiring way. I, Nicole I and Louise, I think. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. I, I guess, I, yeah, and I think that's a kind of interesting um, view of, to, of, of storytelling um, in relation to the past because because as I, as I was talking about earlier, you know, when we're telling those stories about the past, they're from the present. And in some sense, they're also from the future. And therefore, what we, what we understand of the past is never... It's not the same. And it's not the same as somebody else's experience of it either. So there's kind of multiple storytellings, right? Mm. And so when you open that out, for me, that's the fascinating thing. Right? So if you open that out to multiple stories and multiple people's perspectives on that, what happens to that object? What happens to the past? Right? So, so in, um, in one sense, the storytelling is mediating right, the actual object. So. Louise, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I did. I'm, just, I'm sure I should have something to say to that particular point about the storytelling, but I can't <laughs> get it together right in this moment. But the one I wanted to say is that participation means resources. So I think anybody who actually engages with the public through public programs, etc., to to make participate, like I suppose my point is we mustn't, uh, we need to be mindful that some, only uh, Nina Simon, museum studies person who's researched participation in museums really heavily, and her stats are something like, um, it's 5% who want to actively participate, it's 85% who want to watch other people participate and it's the other 5% who want nothing to do with it. So the thing is the people who will actually tag and engage is a tiny group. It's like the whole Wikipedia model where the editors are 30%, you know, the, the, the number of editors is so tiny, it's very gendered, it's a very particular form of engagement. And it has, so my, my point is about tending is that these resources need care. And care means resources, means you know, money, basically. And um, I would love to see more of that happen. I have a whole other argument I could make to you about the business of people who care about stuff being best placed to look after it. After it. And, but again, that's something where the resources need to flow. And we can see that the future's unevenly distributed. When we, I was trying to work out the sums on the Caldor digitisation compared to the National Archives. So there's 120 shelf kilometres of records of the Commonwealth Government out there at Chester Hill next to the Villawood Detention Centre. So, and that's just in Sydney. So this, the future does look unevenly distributed, unfortunately. And that, that's a lot of stuff to digitise. I wanted to come back to Claire, um, Claire's comment about um, really the division of labour in the museum. So all of us here care very much about uh, all of the work that's being done, not just in the museum, not just in the display and the participation of our audiences in those displays, but also with the cataloguing, with the care for uh, the, the archive as well, as well as a collection. Can you talk a little bit about um, what's happening with curators and uh, archivists and the example that you were using uh, in your talk about um, some of the issues that you're starting to work uh, on here at the Art Gallery. Sure. So... Um, Without being too political. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, well, one of my colleagues, Lisa, is here. And Lisa is a assistant curator in contemporary art. Um, and she has an immense interest in the archives I would say and that interaction between the archive the art collection and then how we might kind of harness those interactions in a, an exhibition space or you know public program space um, so I think um, some of those activities are slightly dependent upon individuals um, you know I think uh, a lot of what we're doing is still not broadly understood by the rest of the institution. Um, you know, so we have, yeah, basically, that that's how it's it sits. But we're getting there. Yeah, 
And maybe in other institutions represented on the panel, how do you see the relationship between curating, the work of curation and then the work of the archive? Pass the mic. I mean, I can. And then I think we've got time for one last question before we're going to wrap up. Well, um, Cal does a very small team and I'm an archive curator, so um, there sort of isn't necessarily... You get the two difference. roles in one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I got to collaborate on the project with Michael Landy, which was great. We also have, you know, a curatorial team or curator. Um, so I think, yeah, it just depends. Like the previous role I had at the National Gallery, I was a assistant curator in a collection that had archival materials. So I think Claire's right, it sort of does vary a lot. And um, I mean, you'll probably gather from the way the, the website's been put together as well that um, it's not really adhering to strict archive standards, nor is it adhering to strict museum standards. It's actually responsive to the collection. And that's the way I work. And I imagine most people do work. Yeah, great. And Katrina, did you want to add anything to that or anyone else on the panel? To curate means to care for. Yeah. It does indeed, Stephen. Yeah. And that and that is one thing too. I think um, you know, ar managing archives is hugely labour intensive, yeah. Yeah. and that is something that's not understood. And so you know, sometimes there's this expectation around archives. Oh, you're just going to digitise it all? It'll be available on Trove in six months' time. And it's like you know, and we have a huge army of volunteers who help us with um, the physical processing of archives. You know, and that's unpaid labour that really should be paid for. Um, you know, that's another issue too, to be political again. So I think Lu Louise is going to make the last comment oh, and then I? we're going to wrap up. Okay, it was shameless self-promotion. So I am... Um, the Rizzeria downstairs... I'm not sure that we had a paid ad here. Has, um, <laughs> go for so it. So you can go down and check out the public program that's running at the moment. Yep. And in the centre fold, you'll see me. And... Um, what my point, one of the points I make is that the public's not frightened of archives. They find them fascinating. Um, again, that's a personal opinion, but it is borne out by my evidence of standing in box one for a really long time, twice, and watching how long my fellow visitors stayed. And it's also my experience from observing, observing the few heavy archives-based exhibitions that have been held at the National Archives, where the public just loves absorbing, dwelling, in that material. So I think that's probably a great place to end. We've got a plug for the Caldor Public Art Projects downstairs for your participation. I uh, wanted to thank you all for caring so much for coming today and I uh, wanted to uh, thank all of the panellists for their presentations and the conversation. Please join with me in thanking all of our panellists. <laughs>